For over 70 years, the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Marin has worked to inspire joy and justice in an imperfect world, sharing life's journey, celebrating many paths, and acting to make a difference. UU Marin celebrates people from all walks of life. No matter how you make your living or how you experience the sacred, no matter who you are, where you're from, or who you love, you are welcome here. If you're seeking open-hearted community, a place where you can have a real day-to-day -day impact in the world, and a space for the whole family to grow spiritually, come check out the church at the top of the hill. Come join you. Good morning, it's nice to be here. Uh, the reading I'm going to do is a selection from the book that I've written called Held. And it is a story that was told to me originally by the Reverend Mark Morrison Reed, who's a Unitarian Universalist minister. He said, Nate was maybe in his 30s. He would sit in the front row, rubbing his legs and rocking back and forth during the worship service. He was a bit awkward. His voice was loud, and from time to time, he would disappear altogether. One weekday, Donnie, Donna, who was Mark's wife and co-minister, Donna and I were at a bridge party with the senior members of the congregation. They were mostly in their 80s, and we gathered in a nice suburban apartment. There were plenty of appetizers, serious card playing, and some light conversation, until the host said, I don't know how you put up with that young man 
fidgeting around like that throughout the entire service. It's just horrible. What happened next left me stunned. One octogenarian said, you do know it's his medication that makes him do that. A retired public health nurse told us she had spoken to him and knew what had been bothering him. A former university president said, I was once institutionalized. And someone else said, my son has bouts like that. Neither Donna or I said a word. My amazement turned to pride, and I knew why Nate kept coming here. It was not about the sermons, whether scholarly or entertaining. It was not about universalism or the professed belief in a loving God. It was our lived theology. God made manifest in the love that surrounded that young man. That ends the reading. No one here to guide you. Now you're on your own. Only me beside you. Still you're not alone No one is alone Truly, no one is alone Sometimes people leave you Halfway through the wood Others may deceive you you decide what's good, you decide alone, but no one is alone. People make mistakes, fathers, mothers, people make mistakes, holding to their own, thinking they're alone. Honor their mistakes Everybody makes One another's terrible mistakes Witches can be right Giants can be good You decide what's right You decide what's good Just remember Someone is on your side Someone else is not while you're seeing your side, maybe you forgot they are not alone. No one is alone. Hard to see the light now. Just don't let it go. Things will come out right now, we can make it so. Someone is on your side, no one is alone. begin with a story. There's a woman, this actually happened in my congregation. <laughs> so there was a woman and a, um, a couple, a woman and a man, who had a daughter who had serious mental health problems and had been hospitalized in a psychiatric ward, not, not too far from where we live. And she and her husband would come home from work and go and visit their daughter 
in the psychiatric ward every evening. One day, they got a, co a phone call from um, the caring community at our church, and they said, so-and-so in our congregation has a family member in the hospital. Could you possibly bring them a, co a casserole um, to, to help them? And they, they wanted to help, so they put something together and went over and gave the casserole to the other family and then went off to visit their daughter. When they were on their way home, the woman said, wait a minute, we have a family member in the hospital. Nobody's bringing us casseroles. What's going on? Is there a double standard here? And the answer is yes, there is a double standard. Um, so if you get anything from this sermon at all is we got to get rid of that double standard. Um, there are a lot of reasons why people might not be visiting or, or bringing casseroles. Maybe the people don't want someone to know that they have a member in the psychiatric ward and so they don't publicize it. Or maybe people just don't feel comfortable about that kind of, th recognizing that kind of thing. And I would say probably drug rehab has the same kind of situation. Don't bring casseroles to people who have a, I'm a family member in drug rehab. So um, this no casserole disease has to stop. So let's start and, and talk a little bit about mental health. My, minist my ministry as a community minister, I focus on mental health issues um, and just to let you know basically what I'm talking about. The prevalence of mental health, one in five American adults each year has, is diagnosed with a mental health difficulty. Nearly half of these coexist with addiction. Nearly half. And it's worse since the pandemic. I've heard now one in four or even one in three, sometimes people say, that's a lot of people when you think about all the millions of people that live in the United States. So um, every Sunday, you can be sure that the pews here and the Zoom screens, for those who are wa watching online, are filled with people that are living with mental health difficulties or substance abuse difficulties. And many of them are suffering silently and are coming to church because they're, hope, they're trying to get some hope to live for the rest of the week. So what is mental health? Um, these are definitions from the American Psychiatric Association. Mental health is a successful performance of mental function resulting in productive activities, fulfilling relationships with other people, and the ability to adapt to change and cope with adversity. So productive activities, relationships, and being able to adapt to change, mental health. A mental disorder is defined as a behavioral syndrome, meaning a collection of symptoms, creating impairment or distress in thinking, mood, or behavior that has been diagnosed by a mental health professional. And um, I also want to get across the idea that mental health is a continuum where not everybody is mentally healthy or everybody is mentally sick. It's, we all live our lives somewhere on that continuum. As, as, as uh, time goes on. What does it mean to be recovered from mental health? What does recovery mean? It's a process, this is from uh, SAMHSA, uh, US Government Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Agency. Mental health, re health recovery is a process of change in which people improve their mental health and wellness live a self-directed life, and strive to live to their full potential. It doesn't necessarily mean the lack of symptoms or the lack of absence, um, absence of the need for medications. 
So I can uh, personally relate to that because my ministry in doing this work is largely motivated by my own personal experience of a mental health crisis. And that um, occurred to me when my daughter was born. I had a severe postpartum depression. And she's now 45 years old, so that's how long ago that was. <laughs> Um, and I was uh, hospitalized for depression because I was suicidal. Um, I felt like a damaged human being, like I was um, not worth anything anymore and I didn't want to live. Um, Eventually, and this was, it took years of therapy, I um, had an experience um, after I'd seen my psychiatrist um, in which he asked me, what are you doing for yourself spiritually? And I said, nothing. Because even though I had grown up in a uh, Christian church and went to youth group and so forth. I had not gone for many years, maybe 15 years or so. And he said, well, would you like to learn how to meditate? And when he told me that, I thought, what? You've got to be kidding me. You're sitting around doing nothing. How is that going to help anything? <laughs> but I had promised myself that I would do anything that he I trusted him uh, because he basically saved my life. Um, and I trusted him and promised myself I would do anything he suggested. So he gave me a little book on meditation, and I went home and I read it. And I would sit maybe for five minutes or 10 minutes or whatever. Um, and it was literally the only time in my life, in my day, that I wasn't rushing from one thing to another. I was just being. And the next time I went to see him, I, I told him, I don't know where it came from, but I'm happy. This is something I had not felt in literally, I think it was eight years. And um, I never forget what he said. He pointed at me, it still gets to me. He pointed to me and he said, it came from you. What a moment of truth that was. It was like my head just turned around and realized there is something precious and unique inside of me. There is something sacred even inside. And it's not only in me, it's in every person. Um, they have something sacred within them. And um, I felt so incredibly blessed to have had that experience, and it was a, um, a spiritual experience for me. And um, I experienced what one might call a rebirth. You know, that isn't um, too strong of a term to put to it. It's a rebirth of, way of the way I was thinking about my life, what was important, what was um, where happiness came from, and all that kind of stuff. And eventually, it led me to leave my first career. Um, I um, worked as a computer software engineer for IBM <laughs> for 25 years. Um, and you know, the programmer and did all kinds of stuff. I loved that job. IBM is a great company to work for. But my life had turned in a different direction of what I wanted to do. And uh, so I retired. I was lucky, lucky enough to have been there for long enough to retire and uh, went to seminary at Star King. And my intention all along was to have a community ministry focused on mental health issues. And I didn't know anybody else who was doing that, but that was what I thought needed to be done, and that's what I was called to do. So um, I embarked on that. And you know, part of, of what I did was to help. Um, I, I went to a I went to a 
well, I realized this was a spiritual experience, so I just thought I should start be going, be starting to go to church again. And I looked around for what kind of church I might, that might fit into this, what I considered universalist. That was just the word universalist point of view. I didn't know what universalism as a religion was, but it sounded good to me. So I, I went to um, a church closest, which was in Hayward at the time. And so incredibly lucky to have the Reverend Mark Bellatini, who is a minister there, which is extremely gifted uh, minister. And um, so I went there, and that was a community that helped and support me, supported me. Eventually, I helped to start a church in Fremont, which is called Mission Peak UU, because I thought, of course, there has to be a church in Fremont. So um, we started a church in Fremont, and then eventually went to seminary um, and started my ministry. So um, I'll talk a little bit about what are the elements of a mental health ministry. Um, thinking about uh, uh, a person's entire life, that's important. So it's not just you go to a psychiatrist and take those pills and everything's okay. That's an important part, if that helps you, if that's an important part. But there's other parts of your life too that need nurturing. There's the emotional part of life, there's the spiritual part of life, so getting in, involved in what's meaningful to you. There's the intellectual part of life. What are you learning about? Keeping your mind open. There's the physical part of look. How are you taking care of your body? Uh, how are you, what kind of exercise are you getting? What are you eating? Um, there's an environmental part. Are you, do you have any cl um, connection with nature? There's a financial part. If you, do you have enough to finances in order to live the way that you need to live? There's an occupational part. Are you doing something with your life that you think is important? You know, that was me changing from being a programmer to a minister, <laughs> doing something important. And there's a social part. You have friends, people that you integrate with. So all of that are, is, you think, can you think of as healing the whole person? And a lot of times when I'm working with somebody in the mental health center, I'll, I'll, look at them and you know talk to them and learn what's going on with them and they'll think what's missing you know what what of these things are missing and what might um, I be able to suggest to them as a possibility for consideration so a mental health crisis is a spiritual problem as well as a psychiatric problem a person may feel Doubt, ex existential doubts about their selfhood, about truth, about meaning, about love, and about agency. And it might under, undermine the, their faith in the divine or their belief in justice. So that's the spiritual part. And there have actually been some research that's done, was done um, within Alameda County looking at, uh, they asked a whole bunch of people, family members and people with, that have mental health difficulties, sometimes we call them consumers or consumers of mental health issues. Uh, what is it that helps you the most when you're having a hard time? The number one thing was spirituality, the number one. And that is their number one coping skill. A lot of times that's prayer meditation, music, maybe having spiritual direction, uh, some of the um, martial arts, tai chi, qigong, yoga, chanting. Uh, those are just an, a small number of things that people do for spirituality, but that is the number one thing. And um, even though, you know, Sigmund Freud thought religion was an illusion, you know, and even though the psychiatric profession had downplayed it or even considered it a symptom, <laughs> he said you were religious, um, even after all of that, the number one thing that helps people is spirituality. So 
So um, talk about some of the elements of, uh, of what a ministry is. First, there's hope. Hope is the first step in recovery, and we may need to hold hope for someone if they don't see it. So um, I'll give you the story. The when I was hospitalized in the psychiatric ward, my doctor said, well, I can help you. I've helped other people with postpartum depression. And I thought, yeah, he just tells that to everyone. I didn't believe him. My family members said, you know, we love you. We want to support you. You know, you'll, you'll be back to normal soon. And I thought, I'm just a burden to them. And then in the hospital, another patient came into my room and sat down and said that she had been, uh, she came to the psychiatric ward about three weeks before and had, um, was re very disturbed, but she'd been, you know, had the therapy there and the medications that she was able to take and it worked for her. And she was feeling so much better and she was almost ready to get, get out. And she said, if I can get better, so can you. And when she said that, I believed her. You know, so it was coming from a peer <laughs> that you can hear sometimes the same thing from other people and you don't believe it, but it's coming from somebody who you think is a peer. That's why I'm so, um, I, I think it's so important to um, be part of a peer support group. So that was the start of my recovery, was that little bead of hope that I got from that woman. So you remember that um, that's never, never too, too late to, to tell somebody that you have hope for them. Another thing that's important is presence. That means actively listening, being with someone, listening without judgment, validating their feelings, and not giving them any advice. Presence is a sacred gift, and we all have the ability to give that gift. Um, so another story, when I was, my internship was, was um, in San Francisco, and just a few weeks after I had gotten there, there was a, um, a woman who I knew had, I was living with uh, severe anxiety. Uh, she came up to me in su one Sunday morning when people were rushing around getting ready for the service, and she said, Barbara, Barbara, I'm so anxious. I don't know what to do, please help me. And I thought, what am I gonna do? So I suggested to her, why don't you and I go and into the library, because I knew there was no one in the library at that time. We went in, closed the door, and I sat there holding her hand, thinking, what am I gonna tell her? How, I can't think of anything to tell her what to do to get rid of her anxiety. But I, I, no words were being spoken, I just sat there. After a couple of minutes, she turned to me and said, I feel so much better just being here with you. What a lesson for me as a minister. And I tell you that you can give that kind of gift as well. So what is it that helps people besides those things? <laughs> Uh, some kind of either professional or peer help. You know, sometimes people don't have uh, good luck with professional help, and peer help can be very important. Caring for their body, getting enough sleep, eating enough things, getting exercise, managing your stress in some way, being aware of your emotions so that if you sometimes have have uh, fluctuations in your emotion and you can tell, see a pattern, you can be aware of something's gonna happen and take, act, take evasive action before it, it happens. Um, enriching your life in some way, either um, creatively, um, artistically, reading things, learning things, and engaging with your spirituality. All of those things are important. So what about family members? They are suffering too. 
a different way of suffering because they love their, their, their loved ones so much and they just want them to get better and um, have a really hard time with um, trying to find something that's important. So the things that can help them are professional or peer help, a uh, peer organization that is most helpful to family members is called NAMI, or the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Um, they have chapters all over the United States, and they're very uh, active in, um, in giving support. They have support groups for families. They, have, they also have support groups for consumers, for people who have mental health problems as well. Help your loved one live with their situation. So if, if um, there's too much activity and it's, you know, it's setting them off, you know, find, help them find a quiet place to be. Or if they're having trouble keeping track of medications, help them figure that out. Or maybe give them a ride to the doctor if they need that. And finally, have a life of your own. Don't let that take over your entire life. So, um, another thing that, 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 is, that is very um, helpful that I've, that I've found is um, support from a loving community. And I can see by your faces here, and I know that you folks are online, are part of the loving community as well, that this is... Um, a community that can be helpful and supportive of individuals. And um, many times what I do when I'm speaking in a congregation is ask to people as an act of public witness to rise in body or in spirit if they can't rise in body. If so, you or someone you love has lived with a mental health difficulty, a mental health crisis of some sort. So I'm gonna ask you now as an act of public witness to rise in body or spirit, or raise your hand if you can't rise, <laughs> if you or a loved one has lived with a mental health <laughs> difficulty. And if you're online, you can write yes in the chat if this affects you, or no if it doesn't. So this is typical, almost everyone. <laughs> so you can be sure when you come in Sunday morning and sit here that these are folks that have been there too. And it is okay to talk about this in coffee hour. <laughs> it's okay not, it's okay to um, fight against the stigma of this illness. So thank you very much. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free.